Uh, it's, it's a pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, Anthony Donaldson. I have known Anthony for a long time. Uh, I've known him since he was working on, at least since he was working on his master's degree uh, and his thesis, which was a biography of George Petrie uh, when he was a, a graduate student at the University of South Alabama. I got to know him even better when he came to Auburn uh, to work on his uh, doctoral degree in history. Uh, and I got to know him uh, even better when he came to work in special collections and archives as a graduate uh, uh, assistant. And I got to know him even better when uh, he got into the research for his doctoral dissertation, which is, you, is, is basically the, the, the title of today's presentation. It's a study of the political and financial rivalry between Auburn and Alabama set in the context of other comparable in-state rivalries between schools like Mississippi and Mississippi State and Michigan and Michigan State. Uh, this is his doctoral dissertation which he says he will defend this summer, he hopes. Um, uh, his dissertation director is Dr. Wayne Flint, who was one of our uh, speakers in this series and who will speak yet again in this series. Uh, Anthony uh, today will talk to us about uh, a portion of his dissertation. He's going to focus on the 19th century uh, today in this political rivalry, which uh, predates the football rivalry. Uh, and is, has been at least as bloodier, bloody if not bloodier than the football rivalry. Now I want to say one other thing to uh, add to Anthony's credibility, uh, or two other things. One, he's a native of Sampson, Alabama. Um, and the other thing is that he is a University of Alabama fan. Uh, he roots for the Crimson Tide. Uh, he, has, uh, he will soon have a degree from Auburn. Uh, he has worked at Auburn, uh, but he roots for the Crimson Tide. So uh, uh, you're about to hear an objective account <laughs> of, this, uh, of, this, uh, of this story. And if you don't like it, uh, Anthony probably won't care. <laughs> I'll care. I'll care. <laughs> Anthony Donaldson. Thank you very much. I'll ask you first of all to please bear with me. I've been sick and I still sound like I'm talking in a drum, I'm afraid. And I'm really afraid of all this stuff. I'm going to trip and break my neck, so bear with me. We've also had some technical difficulties, as always happens with technology. So, But uh, I have had a lot of help and we're going to try to show a few images along the way. Uh, a few might be missing, but we'll do the best we can. Um, I was first introduced to this struggle. Well, obviously, as an Alabama football fan, I well know the struggle. Um, and if you live in Alabama, you well know this relationship between Auburn and Alabama has traditionally been pretty ugly at times, especially the athletic rivalry. But when I was working on Auburn history professor Dr. George Petrie, I learned and saw snippets of this relationship through the years and the struggles and it got me interested and when I came to Auburn I thought that might be a natural uh, topic to look at and continue uh, looking at this relationship and it has one that is certainly as Dr. Cox said does predate um, the football rivalry and a lot of it has to do with these two institutions and how they attempted and, and have continued to define themselves and how they see themselves uh, politically uh, and their educational roles and missions uh, in serving the state. And I'd like to start a little bit looking, as I said, at the 19th century. When Auburn President David French Boyd wrote in his resignation letter to the Auburn Board of Trustees back in 1884 that he hoped that the motto to Tuscaloosa for the classics, to Auburn for the technics, would not become a popular slogan um, in Alabama. He succinctly, I think, summed up what would become one of the major debates that would define the relationship between the two schools, really, um, for nearly a generation. And since the establishment of the A&M School here at Auburn, 
These two schools, colleges, have experienced an uneasy relationship that has occasionally bordered on hostility. Now, the University of Alabama, as most of us know, if you're a native, certainly, uh, was founded, opened its doors originally in 1831, uh, always considered itself the flagship college of the state. And while its supporters claimed that the university was an academic juggernaut, the school really did not distinguish itself to any great degree um, during the 19th century. And with the Civil War, of course, it found itself in dire straits. The state of Alabama was fortunate to avoid most of the great pitched battles that occurred during the Civil War. But of course, especially North Alabama, uh, was not fortunate to avoid Union Raiders. And certainly Tuscaloosa was not. Uh, when uh, General James, Al James H. Wilson's um, troops moved through the Tennessee Valley, one of the targets was the University of Alabama because it served as a training school. A number of uh, students there would serve in the Confederate Army, so it was seen as a military target. And when Union soldiers showed up in Tuscaloosa, they pretty quickly burned the campus to the ground with the exception of about four or five buildings, including uh, the President's Mansion here built in 1841. So with the university now being burned to the ground, uh, didn't look too good, of course. The South, Alabama is going to find itself devastated uh, at the end of the Civil War. And quite frankly, in those years immediately after the Civil War, things didn't look too hopeful for the university because the university got caught up in the struggles of post-Reconstruction politics with radical Republicans uh, attempting to take political power in the state. Uh, for example, uh, at one point uh, in the, right after the Civil War, 1867-68, uh, in this political struggle between radical Republicans and former Confederates. Radical Republicans replaced the university's board of trustees with their own people. They wanted to make the university a bastion for Republican ideology. Uh, and as a result of that, a lot of Alabamians didn't appreciate it, uh, and the Ku Klux Klan didn't appreciate it at all, and they decided that they would use whatever means necessary to intimidate and sometimes commit physical violence against students and faculty at the university. And as a result of all this mess, the um, university did not successfully resume full operations until about 1871. And that 1871 figure uh, date is, seems fortuitous in a lot of ways. It seems like a very fortuitous moment for the university and its history because the timing appeared to be perfect because the state of Alabama was about to be granted um, an opportunity to create and found a land-grant college that they hoped would, of course, bring great glory to the state. And, of course, university supporters very much wanted to get this land-grant college. Much to their dismay, though, the state legislature embarked on a bitter struggle, uh, a bitter debate about where to place this new school. And the battle brought out political factions throughout the state that were all fighting for the economic windfall that they hoped, at least, would accompany the new school. Well, the Morrell Act was passed and supported, introduced in the U.S. Congress by Justin Smith Morrell in 1862. It provided grants of federal land to each state for the establishment of colleges that would teach agriculture, uh, military tactics, and the mechanical arts, as well as the classical 19th century curriculum, such as Latin and Greek, moral philosophy, natural philosophy, those sort of things. The Morrell Act was an attempt back in 1862, to make higher education more accessible to the masses of people. And it sought to provide a practical education to a segment of the American population that really would have never been able to receive such training otherwise. Each state was awarded federal land based on its population. And the states, in turn, were permitted to sell that land and place the proceeds in trust for the purposes of funding these new land-grant schools. Of course, when the Morrell Act was passed in 1862, the country was in the middle of the Civil War. So it's not going to impact states like Alabama until the years after the war. And in February, excuse me, February 1867, the state of Alabama, the legislature, passed an act accepting the terms of the Morrell Act. The state was supposed to receive about 240,000 acres of federal land based on its 1860 population. And it seems that the political struggles, though, that accompanied Reconstruction 
occupied state leaders because it would be about three years before anything was really uh, done, uh, even though they had uh, accepted the terms of the Morrell Act back in 1867. Finally, in February of 1871, the legislature began to take steps for the establishment of this new school. And immediately, it seems, competition for the new land-grant college became incredibly fierce because you've got several towns jockeying for political position uh, with the state legislature. Because the provisions of the Morrell Act prevented any monies derived from the sale of federal lands to be used for the construction of buildings, established colleges like the University of Alabama made strong arguments that the land-grant school should be placed there. And even though the University of Alabama had lost much of its campus during the Civil War, supporters argued that these federal monies that they could get from the land grant could be used for the purchase of equipment and to operate the school. And that, of course, would free up state monies to be used to reconstruct the campus and build buildings on the campus. Well, despite the fact that many state legislators were certainly graduates of the university, the decision over where to place the new college had much, I think, much more to do with political and financial concerns than it did with loyalty to one's alma mater. The battle of the side of the college eventually came down to a struggle between the opposing political economic forces in South Alabama and North Alabama. It was an old story from the founding of the state back in 1820 all the way through the 19th century. There was major political struggle between South Alabama and North Alabama. The state capital was moved a number of times in the 19th century because of that struggle. And the battle over the side of the new college eventually came down to a struggle between these varying political and economic forces in the South and in the North. And it got bitter. An editorial in the Florence Lauderdale Times newspaper expressed the rage of many people in North Alabama over their belief that the southern part of the state was receiving an unequal share of public funds. Quote, we demand a portion of the great state loaf which is being needed at Montgomery, and which busy hands, sometimes alas, unscrupulous in grasping or breaking, dividing and carrying away, east, west, south, everywhere, save to North Alabama, where surely a title to a part may justly be maintained. And North Alabamians fought hard for a piece of the land-grant pie and lobbied state leaders to place the new school in the town of Florence, up near the Tennessee uh, line. The town's efforts were significantly strengthened when the North Alabama Conference of the Methodist Church offered to donate the campus of Florence Wesleyan University, a Methodist college that had fallen on hard times during Reconstruction. It was facing closing its doors, and so the Methodists offered the campus to the state. Another Methodist college, of course, right here, East Alabama Mill College was facing the same type of economic problems, facing having to close its doors. And the Methodists in this part of the state offered the campus of East Alabama Mail College to the state. In addition to that, a number of townspeople got together and raised the money and promised that they would donate 100 additional acres of land if they would bring the land grant college to Auburn. Well, the towns of Tuscaloosa of Florence, of Auburn, were soon joined in late 1872 um, by another competitor. The upstart new town of Birmingham wanted the land grant as well. And of course, they, supporters of Birmingham, advocated that it was a perfect place, the ideal place for the state's new college because of the area's rich industrial resources, new railroads, and according to its supporters, quote, its wonderful climate and its delightful temperature, cool and agreeable in the summer and pleasant in the winter. Well, it seems that Birmingham really was an area of serious contender for the college. The future side of this school was going to be determined by two Methodist colleges and the University of Alabama. And Florence, it looked like, was a shoe-in. Florence was eliminated, though, despite the fact they were the front runner. Uh, by February 1872, members of the Legislative Committee figured out that even though the Methodists wanted to donate Florence Wesleyan University to the state, they had not relinquished all proprietary claims. And therefore, because of the technical oversight and bureaucratic red tape, uh, it eliminated Florence at least temporarily, from the running. 
Well, the Methodists down in Auburn had relinquished all proprietary claims, and uh, that kept them in the running. But the thing is, this political struggle in Montgomery, again, between forces of, of South Alabama and North Alabama, resulted in a tremendous struggle in the state legislature. Every time a legislator would propose and a committee would propose a name of a town, for example, they would put Florence back in it, uh, pretty soon opposing legislators would submit Tuscaloosa, replace that name with Birmingham, uh, and then Florence, and even suggest Talladega as the possible site and uh, for the new land-grant college. At the same time that the legislature was debating the fate of the new school, the University of Alabama wanted very much for the good people in the state capitol who were making the laws to understand that they wanted the land-grant college. At the same time the state legislatures were debating where to place the college, the university sent its cadets down to Montgomery and they paraded all over the capital city to impress upon their state legislature that the university desperately wanted the land grant. Well, finally, in February 1872, despite all of this political maneuvering and political wrangling, and I think a good deal of it had to do with a lot of uh, support coming from some pretty significant uh, political leaders from the Auburn and Lee County area, Auburn is finally selected in enabling establishing Auburn um, as the site of the new land grant college. Well, the response from many people in North Alabama could only be described as absolute, I think, absolute outrage. They felt that once again, South and Central Alabama had benefited at their expense. In an effort uh, to attempt to ease hostilities and mend political fences, the legislature voted in December 1872 to try to placate those folks up in North Alabama. Uh, they voted to locate a state normal school a school that primarily trained teachers at Florence. It became Florence State Teachers College, and of course now we know it as the University of North Alabama. Well, the legislature's decision not to locate the school at the University of Alabama may very well have also been due to the political hostility that would have no doubt come from North Alabama. Locating the college in central Alabama at Auburn was bad enough, but had it been awarded to Tuscaloosa and the university, there would have been a political fallout that the gift of a state normal school in Florence probably could not have reconciled for years. Well, the original legislation that provided for the establishment of the A&M College at Auburn created a board of trustees to supervise the operations of the school. But the bill also specified that the new land grant school could be, if they chose, be made a branch of the University of Alabama. Well, the opposition to the university getting the land-grant school seemed to have thwarted that possibility. Many of the state's leading newspapers had editorialized against awarding the land-grant to the university and opposed, quote, any measure or scheme that looks to making this agricultural college an attachment or even a department of anything. The two schools, therefore, had separate boards of trustees, and state law prevented the location of the colleges from being moved without a vote of two-thirds majority of the state legislature. And I think we all pretty well know that that virtually assured it because uh, seldom since the end of Reconstruction has the Alabama state legislature, and no less two-thirds of it, ever agreed on anything. So Auburn will remain where it is. Well, on a cloudy, rain-drenched day in March 1872, Okay, we're missing some stuff. Sorry. We, I told you we had some technical problems. We'll come back. On a cloudy and rain-drenched day in late March 1872, the Agricultural Mechanical College of Alabama began operating in the facilities of the old East Alabama Mail College. Despite the weather, the new school opened in an environment of great optimism. All of the former faculty members from the old East Alabama College remained. Auburn got a new president, Baptist minister, former Confederate chaplain Isaac uh, T. Titchener, one student who had been a student of the Methodist College and remained with the new A&M College, remarked that the transition, quote, seems imperceptible. Well, it seems that indeed this transition was a relatively smooth one. Meanwhile, back in Tuscaloosa, supporters of the University of Alabama were coming to terms with the fact that they had lost the federal money 
that resulted from the land grant. However, it was not very long before faculty members at the university were painfully reminded that the state of Alabama had a new college. In early June 1872, Alabama officials received word from the governor of Alabama ordering the university to relinquish 75 stands of arms and equipment for the use of the agricultural college in Auburn. This sent a sho absolute shockwaves throughout the university faculty. Some of them just thought about seeking legal advice and asked, can the governor really do this? Well, he could apparently. They didn't seem to pursue it much further. This event was probably, at least as far as I can tell, probably the first case of friction between the two schools and what would develop into an absolute monumental rivalry in the years to come. Well, the scope the new school at Auburn did open its doors and to an atmosphere of optimism. But the, by the end of the school's second full session, that optimism quickly turned to despair. Auburn's administrators complained that the financial situation of the new state school was not much better, quite frankly, than it had been when they were the East Alabama Mail College. The school got some federal funding from the land grant, but it was only a small amount and none of it could be used to construct buildings or to improve the school's physical infrastructure. That was the problem really with the land grant money. There were a lot of restrictions and you could not use it to purchase or build construct buildings. Another problem for the college was the fact that the state of Alabama did not provide any state funding whatsoever for the college. It'll be 11 years before the state of Alabama provides any state funding for its land grant college. Added to Auburn's problem was the financial condition of the country in the 1870s. By 1873, excuse me, by 1873, the nation was going through one of its worst economic depressions in its history. And even though Auburn had managed to enroll 103 students in 1873, the faculty was greatly concerned for the school's future. According to faculty minutes, first of all, quote, men of letters such as usually improved college faculties rarely have any knowledge of or taste for agricultural pursuits. Secondly, there was a prejudice among many farmers for book learning. Well, in an effort to attract students, the state legislature mandated that two young men from each county were to be selected by the county superintendent of education to attend Auburn. They were to be given free tuition to the school. Of course, having to provide free tuition to these students uh, without receiving any compensation from the state of Alabama further created a burden for Auburn's finances. Well, although there were great disparities, certainly, I think in the funding that the state's A&M school and the state university received, there were a lot of similarities, if you think about it, between the two colleges in the 19th century. For example, the academic programs were similar in many ways. The college at Auburn had been established to teach agriculture, the mechanical arts, as well as military tactics, but without excluding other scientific and classical studies. And that was always part of the Morrell Act. Schools like Auburn were always supposed not only to offer those expanded programs, but also mandated to offer the classical 19th century curriculum. And that will at times create a lot of friction between schools like Alabama and schools like Auburn. For its academic program, the University of Alabama offered a classical education to students matriculating on the Tuscaloosa campus, but it also offered a military component to its educational program right on the eve of the Civil War. I think it was in November 1960 before Alabama seceded and before the South seceded. University ed uh, officials, administrators decided to implement military discipline. Now, that was an effort that had been uh, long sought by university administrators, especially presidents, for a number of years. But the timing seemed to be right on the verge of fighting a civil war. So not only would it hopefully improve morality and student conduct at the university, but it would also prepare future leaders for the Confederate Army. Both schools had the military component. And at both schools, students were referred to as cadets. And each school instituted a fairly strict code of military discipline for its students. Upon acceptance, for example, students were required to sign an oath swearing that they would uphold the institution's code of conduct and that they would conduct themselves in a moral and upright manner. 
Sometimes they did, and sometimes they didn't, quite frankly, but no worse than I think anywhere else. They were always complaints of gambling and drinking uh, on campus and the boys going out and getting in a little trouble, but I can't say that that happened in one place more than it did the other, at least in the 19th century. In the 20th century, uh, I think Alabama will get more of a reputation as a party school in the 20s especially, but in the 19th century, I think it was just about the same. But again, uh, they had that military code of discipline, and there were a lot of folks who got demerits when they came to Auburn and they came to Tuscaloosa. It appears that both colleges were about on the same academic level. Professors at the two schools were comparable in terms of education, uh, in terms of training. Also, the types of students that the schools attracted were similar as far as academic preparedness, preparation goes. The overwhelming majority of students who attended Tuscaloosa and Auburn came from the state of Alabama, which is really no surprise, and many of those students were ill-prepared for a college curriculum. Most students, whether they went to Auburn or whether they went to Tuscaloosa, came from rural areas, often attended one-room schools, and received modest educations from teachers who uh, possessed only a fraction more education than the pupils they were teaching. Therefore, it was necessary for the colleges to offer remedial classes to new students. Auburn had a large sub-freshman class that it was operating um, for those young men who come from sections where there are no schools competent to give instruction to fit for college. The university also attempted to address this problem. Um, they had a large sub-junior department. They were operating as early as 1871. The university went one step further. In order to mold the education of its future students and in order to try to prepare uh, these students who one day would be matriculating at the university, they um, instituted uh, a program uh, of designating high schools around the state as auxiliary schools for the university. Schools such as Mobile's University Military School, which now is UMS Wright, if you know anything about Mobile, still around in some form. They were encouraged to teach a, prep, a college preparatory program. These schools would not only prepare young men for advanced study, but they would also serve as feeder schools for the university. And both schools were also similar when it came to the education of women. And I apologize, I have no photographs of women. It disappeared on my PowerPoint, but I did. Um, and the effort to make Auburn co-ed, uh, the effort was, uh, they were bantering around the idea as early um, as 1875 here at Auburn. Uh, and one, one reason was to, you know, help fund the school, get more students. And the faculty had asked the trustees in 1875 to make Auburn co-ed. It didn't happen. Uh, in fact, it won't happen uh, at Auburn until 1892. So some 20, nearly 20 years from the time the subject was first considered among the Auburn administration, uh, women were finally admitted. That was one year earlier than the University of Alabama that uh, began admitting women as first, excuse me, irregular students and then regular students in 1893. And a lot of that has to do, well, it's not unusual. Uh, and if you look at the country, what's going on, uh, the idea of co-education is catching on in that part in late 19th century. A number of schools are doing that. Alabama and Auburn are not really breaking any traditions or, you know, out in front of anybody on that. But certainly in Alabama, one force that I think helped bring about co-education at Alabama and Auburn was one Julia Tutwiler progressive reformer who, of course, was involved in a number of things, and certainly, my understanding, she was a very formidable woman who was very good at twisting legislature's arms. And Ms. Julia Tutwiler uh, put a lot of pressure uh, on the state legislature to force these schools to finally admit women. And I think the admittance of women um, was obviously well received, you can imagine, on Tusc at Tuscaloosa and Auburn, but I don't think it greatly disrupted the educational process, as some people feared at the time. Uh, I think they fairly quickly uh, assimilated into the culture of these campuses. And of course, we're also talking about a time and place where, again, uh, there are an awful lot of restrictions on women um, and on relationships and not too many Girls Gone Wild videos being taken in Auburn and Tuscaloosa at the time. But um, there are a lot of similarities if you think about the two state schools, but there are also vast differences, certainly. 
and none, I think, was more evident than in their physical differences. The university, despite having lost the land grant money, managed to rebuild its campus that had been destroyed uh, by Union Raiders. The state appropriated money for buildings and equipment, including houses for faculty. The school also constructed classrooms, even built a gymnasium in order to meet the growing needs of the physical culture of the late 19th century. And thanks to state appropriations and private contributions, the university was able to establish a, a modest university fund. This endowment permitted the college to become more self-sufficient when it built a barn and a dairy that provided for the nutritional needs of its young student body. The university's board of trustees were pleased to report to the governor of Alabama in the spring of 1890 that the college enjoyed the benefits of electric lights thanks to its new electrical power plant. The trustees also boasted in the same report that the school's new sanitary closets, restrooms, with hot and cold running water, and other important conveniences for students had all been completed. Conversely, when you look at the Auburn campus, Auburn operated on a shoestring budget that prevented it from establishing most of the modern conveniences that were so enjoyed by the students at the university. Auburn leaders always complained of the poor condition uh, and about dilapidated buildings and equipment on campus and the fact that there was little money to make improvements. According to some uh, one faculty leader, quote, how to make our scanty means answer the demands of the college has been the most difficult problem. The college had no housing facilities for its faculty, no halls for boarding students. Students boarded with uh, uh, private in private homes in Auburn. And Alabama had, as I said, university homes for faculty and, and, uh, and dorms fairly early. Without funding from the state, college leaders noted that all the equipments of the college have been provided out of the meager funds of the institution at Auburn. Not only were college buildings in poor condition, but they were also a fire hazard. And school officials often worked to try to make provisions for heating the main building in the winter in a matter which would diminish the danger of fire. And of course, most of us know that the old main burned to the ground in 1887, the site of where Sanford Hall is. Auburn leaders did try their best to keep up with the latest trends in higher education. For example, um, in an effort to meet the growing physical culture of the late 19th century, Auburn converted the fourth floor of the main college building into a gymnasium. The university constructed a separate gymnasium building uh, back in 1890. Okay, let me fast forward this thing. I said we've had some technical problems, I apologize. Poor condition of the school's buildings was undoubtedly most distressing to its students. While the university boasted to the governor in 1890 that its new sanitary closets provided the most clean and modern facilities for students, as late as 1907, Auburn students were complaining about the wretched condition of public restroom facilities at the school. In a letter from a student to Auburn history professor George Petrie, the student wrote, quote, to me, this has been the most excuse me, to me this has been the one great disappointment about the API. I know no grand jury in the country who would permit such a closet as the one at Auburn for any jail or penitentiary. <laughs> well, while there existed a definite inequality between Tuscaloosa and Auburn when it came to funding and the school's campuses, there was really very little difference between their educational programs. This fact began to cause friction between the schools almost from the beginning. Auburn was founded to teach agriculture and mechanical arts without excluding the other programs, the classical studies. And the university had always offered a classical curriculum. The thing is, though, the university as well as other colleges in the late 19th century uh, are beginning to adopt and, and uh, this uh, trend of scientific education that's sweeping the country in the late 19th century. Schools that offer these traditional classical curriculums or expanding those curriculums. In other words, schools like the University of Alabama are beginning to adopt many of the same types of programs and curriculum that land grant and agricultural mechanical colleges like Auburn are offering. So you can see immediately there's competition over curriculum. Well, the traditional universities such as Alabama began to embrace many features of this new scientific education. And this really did create a conflict between the state schools over the educational role of each institution. The university stressed its own scientific course and actively recruited future industrialists of the state to the school. 
Such efforts by the University of Alabama were viewed by most Auburn officials as an affront to their own endeavors. After all, the A&M College had been established to do the very things that the university was promoting. Auburn's leaders responded to what they believed was the university's efforts to usurp the A&M College's educational mission. And they did it with, uh, excuse me, with frustration and hostility. Auburn President Isaac T. Tichner wrote in 1877 in a report to the Board of Trustees. It didn't, it didn't make it into the newspapers, but uh, it, it would have been interesting if it had. Quote, the University of Alabama stands upon one of the richest mineral regions of the world. The great coal field of Alabama, stretching eastward and northward, covers an area of nearly 5,000 square miles. The Red Mountain, the mightiest development of income known on this or any other continent, stands almost at its door. Its shadows, when the rising sun yields its crimson summit fall upon the towers of the university, but these mighty sources of wealth and power have slumbered under the foundations of your university. And in all its history has sent forth not one man among its graduates who know or who knew the value or took more than a passing interest in their existence. The professors in their summer wanderings crossed the broad areas where coal beds jutted from the banks of the mountain streams and they heeded not the black diamonds that lay in such imposing masses on every side. Her students climbed the side of the red mountain and saw its crimson rocks jutting out in crazy grandeur from its summit, but never recognized them as an ore or iron. They laughed at the population whose cabins nestled in the valleys or clung to the mountainside because their garments were colored with the dye stone of the region. And they knew as little of its real value as did those at whose expense they made themselves merry. I think he was a little upset. I really do. As I said, this didn't make it to the newspapers. Well, while Auburn officials were railing against the university and against its interference into what they felt was the college's domain, it seems that university leaders were also keenly aware of what Auburn was up to and its impact on higher education in the state. University of Alabama supporters were more than a little concerned about the growing academic success of Auburn. And when the university was searching for a new president in 1879, the increasing competition from the A&M College was a crucial factor in the selection of Alabama's president. For according to one supporter, quote, the university cannot afford to make a mistake in this matter. Auburn is already cutting ground from around her. Further evidence of this growing rift between the two schools occurred when the university lowered its tuition rates in an effort to increase enrollment. The tuition reduction drew students from Tuscaloosa or to Tuscaloosa that might have ordinarily gone to Auburn. And of course, administrators in Auburn were incensed at the university's actions, which they felt was an effort aimed directly at weakening Auburn. To make matters worse, quote, the university, they have lowered the standard of graduation so as to enable a student to receive a diploma in a shorter time and with, with retainments much inferior to what was required in former years. We, Auburn, cannot succeed in building up our college or even maintaining its present prosperity unless expenses in Auburn shall, to say the least, not exceed those of the university. Well, lower tuition rates certainly in Tuscaloosa certainly did serve to increase the university's enrollment. By September of 1883, University of Alabama officials were sending out press notices to newspapers all over the state informing prospective students that the buildings are full and that no new students will be admitted until new buildings were completed. The university reduced student expenses at a time when the A&M College was struggling, struggling mightily financially. Auburn was forced to compete with the university's lower rates while its professors were teaching more and more classes for less money than professors at Alabama. The 115 recitations per week that the university's professors taught were significantly fewer than the 200 recitations per week that Auburn's eight faculty members were teaching. Not only did Auburn's faculty teach more classes, but when the school's financial situation became critical in the spring of 1880, Auburn professors as well as the college president, Isaac Tichner, felt that they had no other choice, no other choice, but to voluntarily lend one-tenth of their salaries to the school 
in hopes of keeping its doors open. So take a 10% pay cut. To add insult to injury, only a couple of months later, in November 1880, the Alabama State Legislature canceled a $40,000 debt that the university had owed to the state since the end of the Civil War and on which it had never been required to pay any interest. Such incidents fueled contempt among Auburn administrators for the state legislature. Auburn officials decried, quote, the state of Alabama to which we are indebted for nothing but a name will one day await to the fact of our existence and no longer treat her child as an orphan and a stranger. If she does nothing more, she will at least comply with the obligations of her trust and pay to us all the discount we have suffered by receiving her unconcern and funds at par. Well, in time, that cautious, if you can call it cautious, optimism waned. Auburn's many demoralizing trials and tribulations coupled with what seemed to be fairly amazing success stories for the University of Alabama led Auburn President Isaac Tichner to offer a startling proposal to the Auburn Board of Trustees in the spring of 1881. Dr. Tichner suggested that instead of having separate institution of higher education in the state competing for money and opportunities, perhaps the state of Alabama should have one educational system consisting of eight colleges. The departments of this university might, if deemed best, be located at different points in the state suggested Titchener. Titchener's disgust at Auburn's inability to secure any state funding led him to even propose that Auburn and the University of Alabama might possibly be combined into one school in order to keep, uh, in order to secure funding for Auburn. The Auburn president was literally adopting the old axiom, if you can't beat them, join them. Well, he decided it would be easier and more beneficial perhaps if Auburn did it this way. Well, this obviously did not not make it past the walls of the uh, Board of Trustees chambers. But once again, you see this absolute frustration um, on the part of Auburn officials. Isaac Tichner and other Auburn leaders had lamented for years uh, about Auburn's precarious financial position. But it was not until February 1883 that state politicians were finally persuaded by Auburn supporters to provide some funding for the A&M College. The state legislature appro appropriated some $30,000 for the land grant school. It had taken 11 long years for Alabama to provide state support for Auburn. Alabama had been the only state in the union, uh, the only state in the nation that did not provide at least some funding for its land grant college. The money was quickly allotted to repair Auburn's main building, to construct Langdon Hall, the college auditorium, and to build furniture, uh, excuse me, uh, to purchase furniture and equipment and a number of other things. Uh, and that is, I think, Langdon Hall about 1883 or 87. As I said, I apologize, we had some technical problems here today. There's no doubt that Auburn's new funding from the state of Alabama helped to somewhat ease the tensions between the college and the university, but it certainly did not end. In the mid-1880s, Auburn was still attempting to define itself and its educational role to the people of Alabama. And new Auburn president, William Leroy Brune, quickly found himself defending the school and wrote that it was, quote, it's an unfortunate and widespread fallacy that the college fails in its purpose if it does not turn out farmers. Of course, the Morrell Act had always demanded that Auburn do much more than turn out farmers. And in an effort to curb confusion, the school's faculty authorized in 1885 that the college catalog would be printed with the words Alabama Polytechnic Institute to reflect and try to advertise the fact that Auburn was much more um, than many people thought. Uh, it would be 1899 before API would be, become the official name of the school. Well, Auburn definitely fared better financially in the late 1880s, thanks to some state funding. However, the amount of money that Auburn received was still less than the university was given. And Auburn leaders attempted to gain more funding by urging the state legislature to institute a tax on commercial fertilizer. And that effort went through a number of struggles and was defeated for years. Uh, finally, Auburn did get some funding, 
later on. Uh, but uh, for much of the 19th century, it was quite a struggle uh, to, to get really anything. In addition to the defeats of increased funding proposals. Auburn suffered a defection of one of its own to the enemy camp in the spring of 1886. Former Confederate General Henry Clayton, who had been a longtime Auburn Board of Trustee member, resigned his post and accepted the presidency of the University of Alabama. Although Auburn officials wished General Clayton well and thanked him for his years of service, uh, the incident must have been a blow to Auburn. Well, there are a number of factors that contributed to the stressful relationship between the colleges at Auburn and Tuscaloosa. The competition for funding, for students, for educational programs, and for prestige all impacted this relationship. However, nothing, and I mean nothing, came close to what would take place between the two schools beginning in the 1890s. The association between the schools had been volatile from time to time but it would ignite in 1893, and not because of funding issues or turf war over academic programs, but because of a simple game. A new sport which had been sweeping college campuses in the North, beginning in the 1880s, began to make its way south in the last decade of the 19th century. And of course, that sport was football, and it would forever change the relationship between the University of Alabama and Auburn. Professor George Petrie, history professor at Auburn, who is, oh, there he is, in 1892, had he received his PhD at Johns Hopkins and had witnessed the new game that was sweeping the North in the late 1880s. When he came to Auburn, he introduced, he organized and coached Auburn's first football team um, in 1892. Similarly, that same year, the um, University of Alabama introduced football. A similar situation, someone had experienced the game up north and had brought it down south to Tuscaloosa. Well, having been rivals for funding, for programs, academic programs, students, political power, since 1872, it seemed only natural that the two schools would become rivals on the football field as well, and that is exactly what happened. In fact, the rivalry was so intense, even before the school started playing the first game, that they had problems just managing to schedule the first game. They were accusations on both sides. Uh, each side publicly accused the other of rank cowardice and shamefully attempting to duck their rival. And they had a heck of a time scheduling the first Auburn-Alabama game. It was finally scheduled, finally played in February 1893 after the end uh, of the regular season. Let's see if I've got that. Uh-oh, hit the wrong button. Okay, I think we're stuck there. Anyway, played after the regular season, as I said, in February 1893. That first football game between Auburn and Alabama was important. It was important for a number of reasons. First of all, it was important to Auburn because Auburn won that game and defeated the University of Alabama. Auburn's victory brought a real sense of pride to its supporters who for too long felt as though the school had been treated as an unwanted stepchild by the state and the university. The game also meant a great deal to Auburn students who perceived a class conflict between most of them and the students from the university. The university had traditionally attracted the members of the Alabama aristocracy, the sons of the old planter class. Auburn, on the other hand, had been founded to provide an education to members of the working class, primarily the sons of farmers. The game was also important to the University of Alabama because its defeat was in some ways a visible sign that indeed Auburn was cutting ground from around her. The game the following year was an even more painful reminder to, to supporters of the university because Auburn thrashed Alabama's football team that year. The rivalry was so intense and so serious that Auburn paid non-student ringers the first two times they played. It didn't take Alabama long to figure that out and to counter. After a couple of humiliating defeats, the university quickly caught on and hired its own non-student ringers for the third game in November 1894. 
and wound up beating Auburn that year. Well, the hostility that existed between the two schools did not even require a game between the two football teams to take place. Any game would do, quite frankly. In 1899, the University of Alabama decided not to play Auburn. And people will argue, Auburn folks will say it's because they were afraid they were going to get beat. And that's probably true. At any rate, they refused to play them. But they did not refuse to cheer against them because a group of Auburn students chartered a train from Tuscaloosa to Montgomery just so they could watch the University of the South, Swanee, play Auburn in a football game and root against Auburn. That's pretty intense. Although many Alabama supporters may have considered themselves and the university as being on a social and educational level above those of Auburn, and that it was not really very important what took place at the a &M College, whether it be in the classroom or on the gridiron, it is evident that the university, its leaders, its students, uh, and supporters saw Auburn as a threat to its position as the leading institution of higher learning in the state. What appeared to be just a simple game to many became much more to people in Tuscaloosa and Auburn. The football rivalry that would develop and intensify especially in the 20th century became a manifestation of the struggle between the two schools for money, for patronage. The educational stakes were high in Alabama because the great political loaf in Montgomery was so small. <coughs> and the two schools fought over what amounted to crumbs. Therefore, every time and in everything in which <laughs> Auburn and Alabama competed, the stakes were that much more important. Football became more than a game <coughs> in Tuscaloosa and Auburn. As early as 1900, it had already embodied the rivalry that began back in 1872. While Auburn President David French Boyd and his fears were not realized, and the motto to Tuscaloosa for the classics, to Auburn for the technics, did not become commonplace, both schools fought extremely hard to define their identities and to distinguish themselves from each other. Despite these efforts, the schools resembled each other in many ways, and the competitive relationship that emerged during the 19th century caused them to implement similar educational programs and to work toward many of the same goals, whether it be in the classroom or on the football field. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. There's some evidence that faculty in the early days played on the football team. Yes, sir. Were those uh, that you commented on uh, faculty members that made it possible for Auburn to win? Uh, Do you he, have any well, notion or evidence? Well, you're talking about evidence? the fixing part. Well, that's a good note. My understanding is that actually George Petrie did play and coach in that first game. Um, and uh, he, I think he only did it one year. He, he, as I said, he got his Ph.D. at Johns Hopkins. And I, I read a letter that he wrote to a, a very famous historian at Johns Hopkins, Herbert Baxter Adams, a very famous 19th century historian, bragging about the fact, I, you know, I'm organizing, coaching football team, a active and all that sort of thing. I got the impression professor, uh, his professor was not all that happy about it. And apparently he was, was not all that enthusiastic among some of the Auburn faculty because George Petrie gave up the football business, uh, at least coaching and organizing after that first year. He was a longtime supporter, of course and always would be remembered as the father of Auburn football. Uh, but he did play uh, in, in that first game, and I have evidence, I believe, a couple of others did as well. How might that go over the faculty today? <laughs> I think we're going to have to do some recruiting. <laughs> I think we are. Um, I think we're going to have to get some recruiting. And we have to perhaps change the way we recruit faculty. Mickey Logue knows better than I do, but I believe Auburn played uh, a couple of other faculty members in the first couple of games, didn't we, Mickey? Yeah, it was uh, big in electrical engineering. Uh, yeah, I know he, uh, big guy, McKiss McKissick. McKissick, McKissick. Yeah. McKissick. yeah. He yeah. played, yeah. But, but this is not really my question, but it, I, I understand now that you're saying that football didn't originate in Alabama. Uh, no, nor did it originate uh, oh, in the okay. South. Okay, I just... <laughs> Although we, we still claim it. I'm sure we've got a, 
a patent on it somewhere. But. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, the Confederacy's lack of industrial might uh, and the problems that that caused for the Confederacy may have influenced uh, Auburn's and other Southern schools' enthusiasm for a more technical education as opposed to a classical education. Was this part of the New South? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you take, for example, uh, William Leroy Broom, uh, the, the school's uh, A&M College's third president. Dr. Broom was certainly representative. He was one of those people who embraced uh, the New South ideology of we've got to embrace industry, we've got to expand, we've got to diversify agriculturally. A lot of these leaders who become, excuse me, college presidents after the Civil War, like Broom, had served in the Confederate military. Many of them had been officers. And after the war, a lot of these people wound up gravitating toward education, and especially higher education, and became presidents of, of various colleges. And most of them firmly believed that the Civil War had, uh, they saw the, the shortcomings of the South during the Civil War. Many of them argued that the reason the South lost the war is because of its lack of industrial capacity, because it had not embraced industrialization to the point it should have. That's not to say the South did not have industry. It certainly did. Often that's a misnomer that, that people think it didn't. It did have industry, but not to the degree. And people like William and Lori Brune, when they come in and become educators and leading educators in the South, they stress this New South philosophy of industrialization, of embracing uh, the, the scientific method that, uh, that goes right along with the creation of, of A&M colleges like Auburn. Uh, this, uh, uh, Professor Petrie, uh, for example, at Johns Hopkins was introduced to scientific history. Um, all this, a lot of this stuff was, was filtering down from Europe and especially from Germany um, in the late 19th century. Uh, and it's, it's sort of this idea of we want to modernize uh, Southern society. And in a lot of ways, Petrie, uh, uh, and a lot, some of these advocates looked at football as being a very modern sport and it will help us modernize. And of course, the idea of, of uh, Southern schools like Auburn adapt, adapting football, uh, football started in the North and filtered down in the South and it kind of late in the South. But once Southerners saw it was a fun game, it was another way to, to, to beat Yankees. And since we had lost on the battlefields, perhaps we could beat them on the football fields and athletic fields. And I think that's, that sort of symbolized to some degree, I think, what was going on in the South. Yes, sir. Uh, nothing serious. Uh, jokes are so much part of the Auburn-Alabama rivalry. You find any jokes from that era that you can tell here? Uh, I don't know if there's any I can tell uh, here okay. at, the, at the moment. <laughs> One thing I'll say this, you know, the, there was a lot of, of bitterness and hostility, obviously, in letters I've read and in trustee reports and personal correspondence. But, you know, there was a general respect, uh, especially between faculty, because, and quite frankly, a number of faculty at Alabama would move over and teach at Auburn, and some of who started out at Auburn would later wind up at, at Alabama, including a couple of fairly well-known deans in the early 20th century. So there was a great deal of respect as far as professionalism uh, among the faculty. Uh, and, of course, the, the thing is, this struggle, uh, a lot of it has to do with, with forces outside of academia. When you talk about political funding, well, Alabama uh, is not getting a ton of money. They're certainly getting more than Auburn in the late 19th and early 20th century, but Alabama is still struggling for crumbs as well. As we well know, as we fast forward to 2006, uh, the, the commitment that the state has to education, K through 12 and higher ed, hasn't made, in my opinion, all that much progress in 100, 150 years, and we're still struggling with those problems. Yes, sir. Uh, one reason for the fa the legislature not giving Auburn much money theoretically would be the federal money, which the the money they would derive from the sale Absolutely. of the lands. But but were there not problems with the investment of this money? This is what I'm, I have heard. Yes, uh, it's a good point. Uh, in fact, both schools had problems with the state legislature. Uh, for example, when Alabama was, Alabama was chartered, um, I think, four years before it actually opened its doors. And the state had problems. The, the, the state decided they wanted to create a charter, a state bank. And they funneled that money 
uh, that was supposed to be used to open up the university and they funneled a lot of that money into opening and supporting uh, a state bank. And of course, immediately supporters of the university said, here it is, the state legislature, politicians are diverting funds. And of course, university officials for years always argued that the state mismanaged uh, money that was intended for the university, and I think with, with some good reason. And part of that forgiveness of that 40,000 debt that Auburn was so angry about, university officials argued that that's money that the state really owed us going back to the 1820s, 1830s. Um, hard to convince Auburn folks of that, but Alabama folks, I think, had a pretty valid argument in that the state legislators had diverted some of that money. Conversely, um, with the land grant money that was supposed to be set up in funds and in a trust for the land grant school at Auburn, a great deal of criticism by Auburn officials that state officials once again had diverted, had mismanaged that money, and that Auburn had not got all it was entitled to. And then one more thing, when you talk about the, the, the argument that state legislators and politicians looked at Auburn and said, well, they're getting so much federal money that means we can give them less state money. The problem with that thinking is that so much of that money was earmarked. The land grant money that came in could only be used for certain things. And so that greatly, um, really, uh, I think, handicapped Auburn. Yes, sir. One of the several ways in which folks from the University of Alabama like to put Auburn down is to refer to us as a cow college. But I think we need to remember when that criticism stings us that the Morrill Act provided for the agricultural and what was called in the terminology of that day the mechanic arts. Right. And Auburn over the years has developed a very strong engineering program which is today's terminology for the mechanic arts. Right. So I think that when we feel put down about being referred to as a cow college we have to remember or we should remember that we have a number of programs here that are very, very strong and, as you, as you said, have been emulated at the University of Alabama, but I think we need to take pride not only in our wonderful agricultural programs, but in our great engineering program as well. Very good point. And certainly, uh, you talk about that competition, especially in engineering. There was a war going on at one point between Auburn and Alabama uh, on creating uh, various programs, as I said, expanding curriculum. And Alabama is embracing the, the scientific method and, and, and uh, 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 expanding, you know, modernization. And they're putting in programs, as other traditional colleges throughout the country, putting in those types of programs. And of course, Auburn is saying, this is our role. You're usurping our role. You're competing against us. Uh, and so they're fighting for crumbs and they're fighting for programs and there's some duplication on some of those programs. And it makes things pretty darn tense at times. Yes, ma'am. Um, is another possibility of, of difficulty of Auburn getting the money that um, we would have had probably graduates from the university in the state legislature, but there would have been no particular graduates of Auburn? In the Certainly state. in the early days, I would agree. Um, in the early days, yes, I would agree with that. But I would say that the, the, there's a you know there's a problem um, persistent problem for a number of years and certainly um, it's not too long before Auburn graduates start winding up in the state legislature in some pretty high places but you make a very good point and I would say certainly in the first few years that's part of the problem other questions well, thank you for coming, and uh, don't forget to thank you very much. much. I appreciate it.